Greetings, cowboy. <laughs> Steve Ricardo, great to see you, my friend. You're still blowing smoke. Yeah. It's it's like a lifelong ambition at this point. Just like you got to rock your whole life. I got to, you know, blow smoke my whole life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask you, man, uh, how, how are you doing health-wise, you know? And, and if you want to talk about what you went through, I'm sure my listeners would love to hear how you're doing. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if any of your listeners know who I am or <laughs> how I'm doing. I uh, Six weeks ago, I, I was driving to band rehearsal and um i had a heart attack um i'd been having some uh weird things going on ever since the summer i had had some dizziness and then i'd had some nausea now i kind of was explaining it away like that's no big deal dizziness and nausea but the truth was when have i ever felt dizzy um, I don't remember feeling dizzy before this. And when have I been nauseous? Well, maybe after I, you know, have a lot of drinks mm -hmm. at the club. But I mean, unless I'm being an idiot, I don't really feel nauseous either. I had a lot going on, Steve. I was like, you know, I, I was about to do, I've been doing a lot of work with my books, signing my rock and roll books. And I've started a new rock band, the Mock Bell Experience. We just did our first gig. Uh, we had just done it in September. Um, Johnny, the guitarist, and I were writing material. I was on my way to rehearsal, all psyched to play these uh, new tunes we had just written. And then I got this pain of death in me. But you know, the thing was, it wasn't in my chest and it wasn't in my heart that I felt the pain. I, I felt the nauseous and the dizziness, which are signs of a heart attack. But I felt pain in my elbows elbows wow yeah. i mean it was deathly pain like my forearms were being ripped off and i was shaking and could hardly um concentrate on anything it was it was a deep dark pain that i can't really explain but but i'd grown up watching red fox on sanford and son and i thought that a heart attack was oh the big one <laughs> i'm coming elizabeth elizabeth I'm for you <laughs> Elizabeth, That's, you know, and until that happened, I figured I was fine. Plus, look at me. I mean, you know, young man, rock and rolling. I mean, no heart attack here. You anyway, look good. So, but, but, um, so I still, even when I, I managed to drive all, myself back home, fell into bed and like a jerk, I didn't go to the hospital directly, even though I felt like I was dying. No, I was in my bed and I wanted to stay in my bed. Um, on the drive, people said, why didn't you call 911 if, if you thought, I mean, I didn't know I was having a heart attack, but I, I knew the end was near. <clears throat> and wow. I was like, well, I was almost halfway, I was near like Concord, which is far away from where I live. I said, I'll end up in the Concord Emerson Hospital, you know, 50 miles away from the South Shore. Nobody knows, you know, it would be, and then the state police will come and impound my car, <laughs> take it out to Chicopee, Mass, which is 100 miles from here, and put it in a lockup with a bunch of junkyard dogs. And I'll have to pay $300 a day. I'm, all this is going through my head while I'm dying. And I'm like, <laughs> I got to get this jalopy home. And I got to get myself into bed. And my wife was begging me to go to the hospital. But I put her off. And I said, it was Sunday night, Steve. I, I and I was talking like a nut. I'm, no, it's Sunday night. All the doctors, they're not at the hospital. They're watching the football game. I promise I'll go in the morning. I don't want to go to the emergency room. Wow. You know, I've just, you know, I watch TV and people are, well, if you go to the hospital, there's people with COVID and RSV and coughing and wheezing and sneezing. I, I don't want to go there. Anyway. So this, this is the problem with these heart attacks. And I guess this is why a lot of people drop dead from them is because um, it's hard to tell you're having one. And even when you are having one, you still don't want to go to the hospital. Once they got me in there, at first I said, I have a problem with my elbows. And they said, all right, kids, sit in the back. We'll call you later. But they called me back up. And when they heard the stuff about the nausea and the dizziness, and then 
They said, did you feel anything else? I said, well, in my biceps, it was universal. Both of my elbows and both of my arms felt the pain. I felt this kind of rippling, like my nerves. Mm-hmm. And the nurse said, uh, oh, nerves. You felt, uh, um, uh, what'd you say? Uh, twi- twi- twitching in your nerves. Uh, that, that was another red flag for them. And then they put me around the corner. They gave me a blood test that I failed miserably for, for my heart. Numbers were, and then the EKG, terrible. Then they spun me around a corner to the cath lab. I watched them put a camera up my artery of my uh, right arm and went across into my chest. I watched, they, they'd given me, they said they'd given me some kind of anesthetic, but I was wide awake. And they're spraying spray paint inside my heart. And they're looking, we're going to see which way it goes. And the paint's just sitting there. And they said, I guess it's not going anywhere. And one of the doctors told my wife that at least three of my arteries were uh, 99% blocked. Wow. So, so that meant that my local hospital down here in Plymouth. I'm on the south shore of Massachusetts. Down here in Plymouth, uh, they can't do open heart surgery. So they sent me up to... Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. and Open um, heart surgery. Wow. Yeah. So then it's the open heart and that involves getting to your heart, you know, and the breastbone has to be, as my drummer Bam says, they had to crack you open, Kyle. <laughs> I'm glad he waited till after it happened to <laughs> because he's in the medical field and he knew, knew all about it. I didn't know, all I knew was Sanford and Son. Um, I have to ask you: Was what was your was there anything unusual about your diet and the way that you lived that could lead to like clogged arteries like that? Yeah, I mean, I I, I tried. If you read my books, you know, I do eat cherry pancakes with red syrup, <laughs> and I, you know, and I don't totally swear off. You know, I'll go to McDonald's once a month, but you know, I try to be pretty careful because, um. You know, I like to be in the public eye and I'm trying to, you know, be uh, uh, in good shape. And my mom, at age 69, had quadruple bypass surgery. Oh, and she's hmm. like a vegetarian, skinny, coast to Maine, uh, you know, hard living woman who, um, d- you know, she wasn't a smoke. All those things you think of, bucket of chicken, smoking. You know, that definitely plays into it. But then there's also people that just have a hereditary. Right. You, my friend, thin, young looking fellows like yourself that, you know, you just never know if, if it's in the family. There's the possibility. Yeah. Um, well, so- I didn't want to have you. I didn't really want you to have to relive the whole thing again. But I was I was curious, curious and I'm sure everyone else was, you know. It helps me to kind of relive parts of it too and understand what they actually did. And I did, I actually talked to my surgeon for the first time Thursday, two days ago, um, for the first time since he did the operation. And um, yeah, everything's on the up and up. I just got uh, uh, allowed to drive again. They don't want you to drive. They, they give you this therapeutic pillow when you come out. Oh. <laughs> Um, for people that are seeing this on YouTube, (laughs) the listeners will have to just imagine what we're looking at. Look, you spoke when you (coughs) cough after you've, I had a quintuple bypass, five arteries, um, had to be, um, wow. Bypassed. They they don't actually clean it out. I think they do when they do a stent, but mine were too much messed up. So they just, they took, uh, veins out of my right leg to repair the heart and they also took some out of my chest to do the, wow. the uh, big one the uh uh what do they call it the widow maker the, there's one artery big one sounds like a norwegian death metal band to me widow maker <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um <laughs> anyway yeah this so i and i also when i've been driving i keep my uh seat belt over this it's supposed to be so if the airbag explodes in your car you the heart surgery doesn't all pop yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> no. All right. I think it's time to start talking about music. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, the last, you know, last couple of times you were here. And by the way, you're in rare company now because you're a three timer. 
on my show. There's only a couple other people. But the last time we were on, we really got into your first book, Once a Rocker, Always a Rocker. And the second time we spoke about Thunder Train in detail. And since then, you put out another good book. I'm saying good because I'm five chapters into it. I got a rock. Uh, congratulations on that, man. I got a rock. Yeah, it's a beauty, man. And so far, I'm going to talk to you about the what, what what I've read so far because you just blew me away, dude. Um, I got a rock. It starts off with a very descriptive, well written review of the first concert you ever went to, the Jimi Hendrix Experience, playing at a venue called the Carousel. Is that was that the name of it in Framingham, Massachusetts, where we actually met. Uh, where you were, where you paid five dollars and fifty cents to go to the show, and I love the detail of your review review from the stage setup, the set list to the greasers yelling for the song "Fire." While reading along, I could I could actually picture the whole scenario. The part about the snare drum was pretty cool. All that. Have you ever written like that before? Because that was really good descriptive writing. Thanks. Uh, yeah. You know, my writing began with screenplays. I, I wrote, um, I make my own films and uh, I was working with kids mostly. And I wrote lots of, a lot of them were science fiction. Sometimes they were like rescue shows, Danger Rescue Team 300. Uh, anyway, the thing with screenwriting is it's a lot of short sentences, kind of staccato delivery. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, since you're using the screen a lot to tell the story, you're not giving the, the actors, you're giving them less, uh, whereas a book tends to be a little more florid in its descriptions. Um, I tend to stay more with my screenwriting. Um, I keep it short, fast, efficient. And, you know, I, I like to put, I put in details that rockers might find interesting you know, uh, that not everybody would probably talk about. Or fans of the rockers like me, because I really enjoyed your description of the stage setup and everything. Yeah. yeah. And, and at, at that time, um, the summer of 68, uh, um, it really was the first time seeing these big uh, English martial amps out in front of us for real, you know, and, and a pile of sun amps that the bass player Noel uh, Redding was using, um, like really piled up. Um, this is stuff that became normal to all of us that rocked for the rest of our lives. But, you know, seeing it for the first time, um, I was just trying to capture some of that awe and magnificence of it all. And, and uh, just a 15 year old suburban kid trying to come to grips with Jimi Hendrix experience coming to, you know, basically coming to my town. Um, and it was basically your first concert too, right? It was my it's first. Amazing. Outside of, a, outside of a record hop in Holliston, my, my hometown, Framingham was the bigger town next door. Yeah. That's where the carousel tent. Mm -hmm. It's really, just, it was a tent. And it started out being um, more um, uh, middle of the road acts like Robert Goulet and Jerry Lewis. The guys you used to see on, Ed Sullivan, when you were waiting for the young rascals to come out and play, and you'd watch all these uh, Sergio Frankie or whatever <laughs> their songs. Um, Sergio yeah, Mendez you know. in the Brazil 66, yeah, is that what yeah. you were? <laughs> well, there was even a, I'm going back. But anyway, um, but, but the promoter of the carousel was Frank Connolly, who before Don Law, he was our promoter here in, in New England. He brought the Beatles to Suffolk Downs and to the Boston Garden. And then he had the carousel and he started bringing the rock bands. Once the rock bands could, once the, I mean, at first, what kid is gonna come up with four bucks to see Young Rascals? Nobody really knew if kids had any money and if that would happen, but slowly and surely, this is, I mean, they all changed. Two year, a year later in 69, once Woodstock happened, that's when the whole corporate, everybody realized, oh, these kids have money. Because and because you're a little older than me, and I don't mean to rub that in or anything. Uh, was was five, I can't, I, my first concert that I went to was in 75 when I was a teenager. It was Jethro Tull and Jay Giles. I don't remember what I paid, but was 550 a lot of money in 1968 to go to a concert? 
for for me it certainly was i mean that was you know it would take me a month to scrape up that kind of money i mean i was just 50 <laughs> uh, you know i got 25 cents a week allowance as i remember it, and i could get, get extra money around the house by picking up sticks or raking or something but you know to get a buck or two what wasn't easy and when i did get any money i had already started my own rock and roll career at that point so i was you know i was tying my broken strings together on my electric guitar because i couldn't afford strings so if money came in it was going to a pick or a string or a so it was a lot of money to answer it was the a question lot of money. i mean because mm -hmm. uh, the next yeah. year the next year 69 Woodstock was in New York and my, you know, Steven Silva from Thunder Train went. I didn't know him yet. A lot of my friends were hitchhiking to New York for it. I was like, $18? Are you kidding me? No, <laughs> I'm not going to buy that ticket. And the other thing was the, sh the band I really wanted to see was not playing Woodstock. That was Led Zeppelin. And guess where they were playing? The Carousel, like three or four days later. Wow. And it was like six bucks. But I was like, <laughs> I'll say it, as it turned out you couldn't get a ticket for Led Zeppelin anyway because all of the tickets got bought up by the Orpheus fans the opening band Orpheus Orpheus Wister band yeah a huge hit here with I uh, can't find the time to tell you and the place was packed with prom dates and and uh greasers who didn't know who Led Zeppelin was some guy from from England I guess I, I never heard of him he uh I wanted to go back for the to the Hendrix thing for a second. Uh, what didn't you mention about the about that experience? No, no pun intended. Uh, that that you could tell us about that you didn't mention. Was there other things that you didn't mention about it, or was it your description of that whole event so descriptive that everything was there? Well, one of the things that I don't explain because in my books I'm always kind of writing um, as I see it. I'm never like, in my book, I never stop to say, oh, and by the way, three years later, she would become Jimi Hendrix's girlfriend or something like that. It's always just, I only know what I know today. Right. Now, years later, I can't name them all off. I'm pretty sure Brad Whitford was at that same Jimi Hendrix concert I was at. I think Billy Lesidgen was at that concert. I think, uh, you know, and our, not, Elliot Easton was probably in New York then, but there had to have been 24 guys that I ended up wow. playing bands and, and knowing who all were between those, especially those two, that, that Jimi Hendrix carousel and that Led Zeppelin show. And I was sitting next to those guys. I mean, we didn't know each other yet, but. Um, That's incredible. I believe that, man. That's I'm that, sure that, uh, Wow, I can't even imagine it. You know, I can't even imagine it because it must have been incredible. Um, I'm going to move along here because there's a story about your dad and the dentist. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? The story about your dad and the dentist oh, in the book? Yeah. Forgotten. It. Yeah, well, that's just, um, you know, my dad was in the audio business. My grandfather and my father were both sound men. I mean, my grandfather going way back to the 30s and 40s, one of the first sound men in the world when the loudspeaker was first invented, he left college knowing that a loudspeaker would change the world. Because I mean, really think about it. Think about before 1928, when you'd be running for president and you'd yell as loud as you could off the back of the train. But I guess the the press had to write down what you were saying and then print it in the paper. Because right. would anybody know what anybody said? My grandfather's like, once they have loudspeakers, and people can talk to the, that's going to change the world. And and so anyway, uh, my dad followed my, my grandfather. They had a shop in, in, in Wellesley, the music box. Famous place. <laughs> and besides doing sound jobs, they were better known for doing audio, um, you know, selling records, selling record players and tuners, speaker systems. And uh, my dad, one of his customers was a dentist in the Wellesley area. This is back when I'm 12, 12 and a half. And at the Bell House, we listened to jazz, we, you know, Brubeck. We listened to a lot of classical music, Julie Andrews, you know, Kingston Trio. My dad would occasionally bring home a novelty record that he just thought was so ridiculous. 
who wears short shorts or, or a surfing bird by the trash men. And Kathy and I would dance around our little re record player. But I didn't really know, I didn't have an older brother. I didn't have older brothers and sisters bringing home the Elvis or the uh, Billy, uh, uh, the, the Buddy Holly or, or what was going on. So anyway, one day my, my dad comes home with this pile of rock records. I, I mean, I didn't know what they were. They looked different than those records we had around the house. I'm looking through it. Herman's Hermits, the Mamas and the Papas, Kinks, and then these really bizarre looking um, cats, the Rolling Stones. They just, there was, I think there were two in the pile out of our heads. And then the brand new Greatest Hits comp, um, High Tide Green Grass. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. With the gatefold, you opened mm -hmm. it up and then you saw the pictures of them, you know, and, you know. Keith with his kind of bad complexion and, you know, Brian looking all washed out. And I'm like, whoa, these guys, and cigarette smoke curling up. I was like, I, I couldn't, between listening to it and looking at it. Anyway, the records came in because my dad had a, a client who was a dentist. And the way he had his uh, office tricked out, you'd wear headphones, I guess, while he filled your teeth or pulled them out, whatever he did. And you could choose. Um pop easy listening what a dentist tunes. this is why i asked you about this because this is this blew my mind when i read that and, and my dad at home um had a lot of recording equipment and ampex decks he had all he had all the gear uh early on i mean he was why'd you ever end up being a rock singer you know i don't know where you came from i said like, <laughs> i grew up with a microphone in my hand you had an oscilloscope and a Real to real decks. What do you think is going to happen? Anyway, yeah, he was he was making these tapes that would then play on this contraption, you know, before computers. I don't know how the dentist has set up, but you know, you could listen to the Dave Clark Five. Well, that's incredible. You you also talked about your mother a little bit, and um, I may have missed this when we talked before because I didn't remember you saying your mother was a musician. But I didn't go back and listen to the shows. It must have been great a great experience being raised by someone that actually appreciated well by two people that actually appreciated music like that. Yeah, it it was um, it was great. I just think that the direction. I went like so many from our generation kind of just blew the the minds though of our parents because <laughs> up till then a musician played the accordion or the you know second violin in, in the Boston Pops this whole idea of wanting to dance around like Mick Jagger <laughs> and blow a mouth harp and and, and uh, go hey <laughs> uh, was like what what what's that um, but they let you get an acoustic guitar though, right? Oh yeah, they did. They did. They did support me. Um, they quietly supported me. They were never the kind that said, you are so talented, boy, you're going to go far. They kind of, they were reserved in that. It was like, we don't really understand <laughs> what it is that you're doing, but um, we respect it. And, and this is what you are. And, you know, I would, my father helped me a lot with gear from, from the, the music box um, and, and the music store up the street that sold guitars and stuff. You know, he brought home some stuff for me and they, they were supportive in, in um, but not the way you see in the, in the ABC daytime movie where the helicopter parents, you know, I, but you know, that, that, I, I try to get that across in the book. Um, besides my rock and roll adventures, I try to talk about growing up and without getting too much, you know, I don't want to get all into this is my grandparents and this is where I came from. I just drop it in here and there. It was good. And you also, you also, I was really taken by how much you and your friends were into music and not just a few bands, but a huge variety of music. Because I remember when I was in high school, I knew I had a whole bunch of friends that were into Kiss and they thought I was a weirdo because I like Queen. And then there was one dude that liked Mahogany Rush. And then there was another guy that was into all Clapton stuff. But your friends were a wide variety from what you mentioned in the book. Right. And I think there's such a chasm between growing up in 68, 69 and 
74, 75, things started to get a lot more specialized um, really quickly. You know, the, the dawn of, of heavy metal and, and uh, uh, the, there was, um, what am I trying to say? That there was the whole California sound, you know, yeah. like Eagles and your, your softer kind of sound, your Jackson Brown. Then, then there, there was your hard rock, not to be confused with your metal rock. And then, um, you know, it, it got more and more special. Whereas this, the 60s guys, we all grew up listening to, you know, Eva Destruction. And then it's Ball of Confusion from Motown. And then it's a Frank Sinatra singing something. And then, or, you know, Frank and Nancy Sinatra together, um, an instrumental tune, you know, the... Booker T and the MGs followed by the kinks. I mean, it was just, and we loved it all. Um, and it make it, and that's always been a hard thing for me to, um, I, I never, um, you know, I just didn't come up in that uh, uh, bubble of, of uh, I have this finite wall of what I listen to. You were very diversified Goodbye. and you had these friends that were diverse with their listening, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely is. It opens, you know, I definitely, I don't know where I'd be if I wasn't totally opened up to, to the sun records and the chess records and, and all of that rhythm and blues uh, background that informs the music that I originally came up with and the garage rock that I loved so much and that so many of us in the rat scene, um, Doug Plain, I think a lot of us came up more in that 60s right. WBX, uh, WBZ AM playlist rather than the FM where it got more um, album oriented rock. AOR radio. As your story develops, you captured the same detail when you saw the Jeff Beck group. One, like I can't even tell you how big of a fan I am of that era right there. You saw them at the famous Boston Tea Party. It seems like the way you described it, that that show really got to you. By the way, I just want to say that the Truth record also from me is a fucking masterpiece, and I love it. And the way you, the way it seemed to affect you it kind of seemed to change you a little bit when I read that part. Am I right about that? Oh yeah. That Rod Stewart as a front man. <sighs> yeah. Um, you know, in that band, um, left its brand on me. And, and it's very hard for anybody who grew up after, you know, that 1975 to understand, wait a minute, Rod Stewart, isn't he the guy with the leopard skin thing and hanging around with blonde girls? Do you think I'm sexy? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, what's what's cool about him? So, you know, it's just, this stuff is just lost um, on, on a lot of people. But, you know, we all live a lot of li lives. And, you know, he, I understand why he did the change. You know, there was Hollywood Rod was way different from the Rod out of the country of uh, singing folk songs in, in the UK that then turned into Spanish boots and turned into the Jeff Beck. I mean, there was so much coming together in that melting pot uh, of, of, of skiffle meets rockabilly meets super heavy meets, you know, amazing musicianship, but also just kind of <laughs> tosh, throw it away, just let it fall where it may. I mean, they would change and, and Rod was, you know, barely 20 years old when I saw him and, and just wow that I was going to get into the faces a little more as we moved along here but when you saw Jeff Beck for the first time I mean that must have been incredible I mean not just with Rod but the rest of the whole band really and then the guitar player who was like to me I put him right up in the top five ever I mean the way you described it was was it, the Boston Tea Party too. That was quite a venue, wasn't it? Yeah, I hope that my description came across. I tried to tell a bit a bit of what it was like going up those stairs and entering the room and seeing all the projections. And yeah, the vibe of the room because um, I don't see that much written about it. Um, 
you know, I tried to, uh, in, in I Got a Rock, really talk about our Boston scene. And what, I, what I'm finding, Steve, is that people from Ann Arbor say, wow, it's almost like you're describing, um, I can't remember, the Grand Hall or wh whatever their, their the, hall. The was. Blind Pig, too, the little club there in Ann Arbor, yeah. The, so, you know, it, it, it translates... Um, even though it's different venues, but it's the same venue in a way, and, and it was the same times. Um, um, but yeah, Jeff Beck. <laughs> of course, you know I'd grown up listening to the Yardbirds, especially yeah. that, having to rave up with the Yardbirds record and to see see my idol, you know, before me like that. It was all um, a little bit tempered because I'd been to the Jimi Hendrix show uh, two months earlier. Um, that's the only reason I'll say that Jeff Beck group wasn't the greatest band I ever saw. Uh, they they were incredible, but Jimi Hendrix experience. Yeah, it's hard though. You know, it's like <clears throat> the, see, first love. You know, you see somebody. If if I'd seen the Jeff Beck group first, maybe, but I don't know. J Jimi Hendrix. Anyway, I'm uh, spoiled with riches here, but. But yeah, um, and I see, love the Yardbirds too, by the way. And I think that Jeff Beck, you know, I take him over Clapton and Jimmy Page, actually. I mean, it's close, but, you know, I, I like Jeff Beck. He, he was my favorite in that band. And then I, to me, he's a guitar god, you know, I mean, it's, I have like five Jeff Beck records, you know, vinyl, you know, and it's like any one of them you can put on and they're fantastic. Oh, yeah. And you just know it's him in every phase of his career, his his sound is uh... the the detail of the book, which is uh, it just continues to be immense as it continues. And I especially enjoyed your study of Steppenwolf, a mm -hmm. band I adore. The put the song the the pusher, which I think you mentioned you covered in one of your bands, and the monster album. Mm -hmm. Those are two of my favorite rock and roll moments. Those two things right there, along with everything else that John Kay and 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 the and the fellas brought to the table. I mean, you know, Magic Carp, Right Born to Be Wild, Suki Suki, all them. But for me, when I first heard the Pusher, I still feel the same way about that song now. And the Monster album. Oh. Yep. Talk Pusher, about Steppenwolf. Pusher was one of the first songs I heard on underground FM radio when uh, when FM started playing rock for the first time. Um, and it's funny, yeah, now, now today, if you're having a discussion with people about the Jeff Beck group and the Jimi Hendrix experience, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go Steppenwolf. Well, wait a minute, Steppenwolf, I don't know. But, you know, at the time, they were right in there, man. And, and, uh, and they stand the test of time too when you listen to their albums um i'm glad that you picked up on that you know that's the i talk about um i think part of the reason i wanted to talk a bit also about bands like jeff beck and jimmy was um for people that had read my first book once a rocker always a rocker and were wondering how did this guy end up being in mm -hmm. perry's band i wanted to show you know the roots of, of what i was digging um, I was digging a lot of the same stuff Joe was digging, obviously. A lot of us were, but um, I certainly was. But then, you know, I also, in my book, I talk about bands like the Young Bloods or the Steppenwolf, or, uh, all kinds of bands that come along that time, and a lot of punk bands later on, too. I, because, like you say, I, I'm not a, a music snob. Um, if it touches me, if it seems real, then um, I, I, I'm apt to dig it, you know? I really appreciated the fact that you you went into detail about Steppenwolf because if I'm not mistaken, they're not even in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is one of the biggest sins of all time, if you ask me. I mean, how can Steppenwolf not be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but Radiohead is and, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers? I mean, come on. I'm always picking on those bands, by the way. <laughs> you, you, you tell an insane story. You tell an insane story about the Black Sun gig in Revere. It sounded like a real showstopper, no pun intended. Once again, as they pulled the plug on you guys, tell, was that that must have been a painful experience for you? It was just, it, it was painful. It was kind of, I'm sure it looked really funny if you pulled back though, because we were really just a bunch of 15 year old kids 
who um, had, you know, we did our best trying to copy the first Led Zeppelin album. And I can't remember who, how we got an agent or what that, some agent sent us to Revere to this room <laughs> said that we're, we'd get 75 bucks if we played. I'm just, terrible gear, little kids, looking like, I don't know what we looked like. And um, yeah, I painted the picture. It was, it was an old guy's dive bar. And, you know, there was not a kid in the place. The jukebox was full of, uh, of Italian favorites. And we barely got into the first couple numbers when, you know, all the grandpas cleared out of the place that were the regulars and there was nobody else coming in. And the manager came out in his shark skin suit and kind of did a thing. Shark he, skin. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you can leave now. <laughs> we were like, wait a minute. We barely started the, the first song. You know, we know like 15 more Led Zeppelin songs. Uh, he says, no, you're done. And then he pulled his jacket open just enough so we could see that he was wearing a holster. And, uh, you know, we'd never seen anything like that. We'd never been to the, barely to the city, let alone Revere. Um, so I like how you said that you thought you heard Revere was a tough town, which, of course, <laughs> it was. It is a tough right. town. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a little tongue in cheek humor and some of my stories especially from you i always forget is it holliston or hopkinton yeah, holliston. Holliston, holliston holliston yeah it's a little safer in holliston yeah, than there's nothing, nothing, we don't we don't have any kelly's roast beef or anything, <laughs> anything like that well at least you didn't get discouraged and give up playing rock and roll after that gig no 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 <laughs> nothing discouraged us and man it was one discouragement after another you know especially when you're a kid trying to get these different gigs and uh and the wild ideas I'd have in my head, you know, yeah, we'll we'll open up with a blue cheer song, and then we'll go into the MC Five. <laughs> and then the, the reality, you know, this was still 1968, 69, and the top, you know, those records did exist in 1969, but um, the top ten that most of the kids at the church dance were listening to at that time <laughs> is still. The grassroots, you know, Midnight Confession, and uh, you know, I think we're alone now by Tommy James and Sean Dell. And the and association. Really, yeah, they weren't ready for Ramblin' Rose and Right. <laughs> so, uh, like I had mentioned, I only got to like chapter four in the book, but I did see a chapter uh with the faces in it, one of my favorite bands, and we talked briefly about them and what I was and you mentioned Rod Stewart, which I'm glad you did, because he put six records out in like three years, three solo and three faces mm -hmm. was he really when you saw him was he kind of someone you were thinking about modeling yourself after a little bit as a singer or 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 was there other people because you seem when i when you mentioned him before you got excited and i i think early rod is amazing myself yeah well that was the confusion was starting with um see with Jimi hendrix he was kind of doing what i was doing i was <laughs> not quite doing it like Jimmy, but I was, <laughs> I thought of myself as a guitarist first. And yeah. Since I couldn't find anybody to sing. I'd sing. And that's kind of how Jimmy always acted. He was like, I know what I'm doing on the guitar. And since nobody else showed up to sing, I'll sing. Now I happen to love Jimmy's voice. I can't imagine anybody else singing those songs than Jimmy Hendrix. Um, but so, so I, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, but when I saw Jeff Beck and I went in thinking, you know, this is going to, I'm all I'm going to do is look at Jeff Beck. But then you go in and, and then the Jeff Beck group turns out to, you know, be Ronnie Wood on bass. Yeah. Killing it and flashy as all hell. Nicky Hopkins on piano. He had his back to us, but still, you know, it was Nicky Hopkins. I knew the name well from all my favorite Kinks and, and Rolling Stones records. Uh, and then this singer, this rooster singing, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm staring at Jeff Beck, the what I'm supposed to be looking at, but I keep looking at the singer. Um, and that's when I started to have this, um, uh, I didn't didn't uh, process it as that yet, but I know that something was pulling me that that's where, you, that's where you're destined to go, man. 
invert the center. Wow. Listen to those first, I mean, that first Rod Stewart solo album, everybody talks about Gasoline Alley, uh, which is great, but the one before it, one that just called the Rod Stewart album that opens with Street Fighting Man and has handbags to glad rags. Now that album. Um, Brilliant. And, you know, you listen to that and I'm like, I'm never going to be a singer. I, you know, I not, can't compare to this guy. Uh, so it didn't like it didn't inspire me to start singing. But on the other hand, I could kind of stand like he did. And I watch how he threw his microphone around and I would mess around with all that stuff. Um, I don't know. The gears started turning. It, the, a voice is a very it's such a personal thing. And I don't know anybody that listens to their voice message on their answering machine and goes, oh, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love that. You know, everybody, nobody ever likes hearing their voice. Um, so it's harder. Um, but I, I came around, I came around and, and also it was just, it was kind of like with Jimi Hendrix. Um, nobody else is showing up to sing. So I'll sing. That's kind of nobody with my bands, either I'd hire a singer, but he'd be such a flake. He'd either be staring at himself in the mirror, combing his hair and forget to come out or else he'd come out and then freeze. He could sing in the shower, but he couldn't sing in front. Um, what I'd been gathering in my years of just playing record hops and teen centers is just the, I was getting used to being on stage. I was getting used to working with crowds and uh, it's that lion tamer thing, you know, just being brave. And since yeah. I don't, since I don't know if you actually saw the faces alive, because we didn't get, I didn't get that far in the book. I loved Ronnie Lane and and Ron Ron Wood and Ian McGlacken and uh, Kenny Jones. I mean, I, I mean, I never. I'm a big Steve Marriott fan, so I never imagined because I, you know, I was too young. I didn't know that you could go from the small faces of the faces and not really lose anything. <laughs> and actually, you know, I love humble pie too. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, I think that the faces actually might be a little better than the small faces. I mean, what's your opinion of that? Well, that's hard because they're just two incredibly brilliant bands. I saw the Boston debut of the faces when they first played. They, by now the, uh, Boston Tea Party on Berkeley Street had closed and had moved to a slightly larger Boston Tea Party on Lansdowne Street. Um, and um, the, the faces, the first time I saw them, they were support act. I think Lee Michaels was the headliner mm -hmm. and uh, the faces were the support. And yeah, that was kind of, we didn't really know too much about it. Um, just that Rod, mentioned that Rod Stewart and the faces and we assumed We'd see some of the small faces. I wasn't, I don't think I knew until I got there that Rod's bass player, Ron Wood, would suddenly be playing guitar. That was kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, the band grabbed us from the beginning. I love Ronnie Lane. Oh, I loved, he's no longer with us, but I loved him. Yeah, his, he was great on stage and his songs were fantastic and, and, and such a, the camaraderie, the, the feeling on stage of that band was what really took me and, and, and what I wanted for Thunder Train and Joe Perry Project and, and, and every band, um, the real brotherhood. Um, I'm going to talk about something that we did talk about before, because this is the one thing that everyone always talks about. And I want you to tell the story again, because I know you told it before. I'm going to ask you about that night that Thunder Train opened for the Runaways at the Rat, because it seems to go down as one of the most historic moments in, in Rat's history. Everyone talks about it. Tell me about that night and tell me about the people that showed up and the whole thing. Yeah, it was a uh, definitely an exciting booking uh, in March of 77. It was... Um, you know, the rat had kind of been around in 75 and 76. And then in the end of 76, suddenly the, the accelerator pedal got stepped on. Jimmy Harold, the proprietor of yeah. the rat, had uh, raised enough money uh, to uh, record a bunch of us and do the live at the rat album, the comp album. That came out in the spring of 77. At the same time, um, 
a bunch of the CBGB's bands. We're looking to expand out of CBGB's bands like the Ramones, uh, but a lot of them needed a slightly larger uh, space on stage than we had. So the Rat expanded the stage in the beginning of 77. The Thunder Train Road crew actually wired it and did a lot of the work to expand the stage. And the Runaways was the band that definitely had uh, a rider that said they needed that, that space. Um, I don't know if Thunder Train was rewarded for doing that, our crew doing that work on, on building the stage or I can't remember. But anyway, Jimmy hired us as one of the bands to open for the Runaways. The, uh, the Runaways were supposed to play three days. Um, Ready Teddy were opening on the Tuesday, the night before us. We were the Wednesday opener. I believe they played a third night Monday with the real kids opening, but I can't say for sure. Anyway, so we were the last night of the three night stand. It was also a big night in Boston because across town at the Harvard Square Theater, Iggy, now Iggy Pop, was going to play one of his first gigs um, in Boston in years. And uh, he had Blondie opening up. Wow. So, uh, but that did not uh, diminish our ticket sales at the Rat. Place was friggin' packed, and Thunder Train was super excited to share the dressing room with the Runaways. We couldn't wait for that. Um, we got there <laughs> all excited, half undressed already, <laughs> running into the dressing room to meet the girls. And but no, they were first time I'd ever heard of a band said, No, we're not going to get dressed down in the rat dressing room with Thunder Train, those perverts. We're going to be upstairs in Jimmy Harold's office. There's a spare room in the back. <clears throat> Use that for our dressing. So, so I didn't even get to meet the girls until they went on for their first set back then you know the the rat used to be um jimmy would have two bands that'd be a, uh you do it what nine to ten i guess and then a band would do 10 to 11 then a band would it was two shows right <laughs> train runaways and then a second show thunder train runaways um so i remember after the first show i was blown away because the runaways come on place is packed everybody's standing up on the tables the girls come out in there silver jumpsuits you know zippers i mean outside of kiss this was the most incredibly outfitted band i'd ever seen and they hit the stage just rocking like they sounded amazing they really sounded good a lot of us were wondering you know is this just going to be one of those things that a bunch of uh, studio guys in la played the instruments no no this this was for real Joan Jett knew how to play. Lita Ford knew how to play. And Sandy West, my God, she was an incredible drummer. Uh, everybody was good. And Sherry had a good, loud voice. I mean, it, it was fantastic. And my favorite was the bass player. Jackie Fox, right? I was, I was, I had a big crush on Jackie Fox. Yeah, she was cute. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I got to get out there for the second show and, and show, show Jackie Fox what I can do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so Thunder Train goes running back out. I mean, you couldn't lose. The place was absolutely, you know, everybody was wasted, having a blast and packed on top of pack. Anyway, we're in the middle of our set. We're doing I Gotta Rock, our, our um, signature song. And I'm going into my rap and all of a sudden, everybody's not staring at me. I'm looking out at the crowd and like people are, they're looking the wrong way. They're, they're turning away from me. What the hell? And I look in the back of the room and that steep, dark staircase that came down to the rat, I see Iggy, followed by his keyboard player and producer, David Bowie. <laughs> also, this blonde girl behind him, I'd kind of heard of Debbie Harry, but I didn't really know who she was yet. Wow. So these three characters all walk into the rat. And uh, so we had to, Thunder Train poured on the the steam you know to get the crowd back you know hey look at us and uh bowie and and uh iggy got up near the the uh uh sound board to to, to get a good uh earful of what was going on and i i talk about uh, uh, quite a bit in the i got a rock book but you know that's when i flashed um and said this is reminding me of 1968 when i was at the boston tea party 
and the Jeff Beck group were playing and they were like the center of the universe. At that moment, Boston was the center of the universe and that was rock and roll. And for that one moment when Thunder Train was playing, I Gotta Rock with David Bowie and Iggy and that blonde girl, Blondie, Debbie, whoever she was, <laughs> um, all watching us. I was like, at this moment, for this one golden moment, we're the center of the universe. Um, and then, and then the Runaways came out and killed again. You know, they were just—you couldn't. I don't care how much we rocked and how macho we were. You know, you can't beat a bunch of seventeen-year-old girls who are just rocking like crazy, and from LA and everything. It, it was just a, such a great time. And then the great party afterwards. And I did get to sit with Jackie, and, and I did get to to uh, share some Chinese food with David Bowie. David, really, David was super. Um, mellow hardly saying anything to anybody that i saw he was just wearing a plaid shirt this is before grunge um never seen a rocker wearing a plaid shirt i don't think david was ahead um and uh yeah he was just a super skinny guy without too much to say eating um some aku aku uh poo -poo platter <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for that, because I knew that you could tell the story better than anyone, because everyone says they were there. You know how that goes. But, oh, yeah, I was there that night. Yeah, OK, sure. I know someone that was definitely there. So before I let you go, I want to ask you. So now that you're re hopefully you're recovering, are you going to try and get back the band going again and try to play some gigs and stuff? I mean, are you or do you need more time to get well? I've got a. I've got my first out of town date book for March 18th um, and I'll either make it <laughs> or I won't um, I'm up in Portland at Geno's good uh, club the mock bell experience. Uh, and that should be great. And we got tiger bomb with us. So if I do expire, we still got tiger bomb. So don't worry. That's it's a real good band. band. Real good <laughs> They're band. Incredible. They're my favorite. Um, yeah. So I'm absolutely uh, and, and a week before that is my first book signing. So I'm looking to get back into business in March. I don't know if I'm going to be hanging from the chandeliers from the get go. I might be doing a little bit more of the, uh, um, what's his name? Jim Morris and, uh, Mike Stan lean. Um, but you know, we'll see. I I've been out trying to walk a mile a day and I've got a lot of cardio rehab about to start up. So the, the docs tell they tell me that once my heart starts, you know, really pumping again, um, well, it's pump. Once I get a little more, uh, I should be pumping more blood than I have in, in, in a decade. And who knows? I could be well, I hope I get to see you play, man. Yeah. Definitely. Hey, thanks a lot, man, for coming on the show for a third time. It's always good to talk to you, cowboy. And uh, I'm glad you're doing good, man. I really am. Thanks so much, Steve. Keep up the good work with blowing smoke. I'm proud of you keeping it going for all these years. Thanks, man. You take care of yourself. I got a rock. I got a rock. <laughs>